Welcome everyone and thank you for participating in today's webinar hosted by the National Latina Network for, Health, for Healthy Families and Communities, a project of Casa Esperanza that builds bridges and connections among research, practice, and policy to advance effective responses to eliminate domestic violence and to promote healthy relationships within Latino families and communities. My name is Jose Juan Lara Jr. and I'm a team member of the National Latina Network. And the title for today's webinar is Enhanced Advocacy and Safety Planning for Immigrant Survivors of Domestic and Sexual Violence, Part 1. There'll be a Part 2 October 24th, so be on the lookout for that as well. Um, so the description for today's webinar, abusers often use the threat of immigration enforcement as a way to maintain power and control and to make victims less likely to seek protection. For this reason, it is important for advocates to understand how to help immigrant survivors become aware of their rights, identify immigration remedies for victims, including special violence VAWA provisions around confidentiality, prepare enhanced safety plans for immigrant survivors, and increase meaningful ac access to services for immigrants and survivors with limited English proficiency. This webinar will also provide updates on recent immigration policy developments and new enforcement measures that impact immigrant survivors. So a couple of housekeeping details. Um, as you join, you are automatically muted, um, whether you join by phone or via your computer. If you are joining us by using an agency phone, um, please make sure to put yourself on hold, as sometimes some of our agency phone phones have uh, hold music, so be aware that that will play over the presenter's voice. Um, if you have any questions, please submit them in the Ask a Question box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. We will also be providing closed captioning as well. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the National Latina Network website. Any resources mentioned will be sent to participants after the call, and, will also re and you will also receive an evaluation after uh, the end of the webinar. We ask that you please fill it out since it really helps us in our shaping the future content of our webinars. I'd also like to invite you to join the National Latina Network um, uh, for Healthy Families Communities. Through the network, you will receive updates on public policy, research, and training opportunities. You can join the network by visiting our website at www.nationallatinonetwork.org. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, uh, Rosie Hidalgo, who is the Senior Director of Public Policy for the National Latina Network. Welcome, Rosie. Thank you, Jose Juan, and thank you so much to everyone who has joined us on this call today. Uh, as we know, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and there's so many critical issues being discussed this month, and I, we really appreciate that you all have taken the time to join us today and talk about enhanced safety planning for immigrant survivors of domestic and sexual violence. And, and we certainly have heard uh, increased re, you know, requests for TA and information on this topic. And because there is so much to cover, we did decide to go ahead and, and, and split it into two webinars with the hope of really being able to go a little bit more in depth into different topics but knowing nonetheless that this could be you know, a two-day or two-week seminar. So not everything will be able to be covered, but we will connect you to additional resources. And so the objectives as outlined are you know, how to help participants be better able to implement enhanced survivor and family safety planning for immigrant survivors. You know, how do we help identify key ways to protect immigrant survivors and engage in systems advocacy that can really improve access to safety and well-being for them. And then how to assist advocates in, in accessing reliable and updated resources so we can improve the advocacy for immigrant survivors. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to be doing a two-part webinar. This part today, October 19th, I'll start with an overview and background uh, with regard to immigration issues talk specifically about special immigration remedies for survivors that Congress has enacted through VAWA and the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, talk about some important VAWA confidentiality provisions that are a part of that, and then also how do we ensure access to services for immigrant survivors and some of the laws and policies that uh, provide that access for anyone regardless of immigration status. And then next week on October 24th, and we really hope you'll join us again then, we're going to invite two of the advocates from Casa de Esperanza's shelter, or refugio as we call it, to come and join us and talk through some hypotheticals 
and they're going to share their own tips on how do we do trauma-informed advocacy with immigrant survivors and, and be able to connect them to resources and do safety planning in light of all the different myriad factors that impact them. And then we're going to share some additional Know Your Rights resources for immigrants that you can share with survivors, additional information about enhanced safety planning and what that looks like, including family and agency safety planning, and critical issues around language access rights and resources so that we can make sure that all survivors have meaningful access to services, yeah, including those with limited English proficiency. So before I go any further, we want to pause a moment and just do a poll of our participants to learn a little bit more of who we have joining us today. And thanks so much for all who have written in the chat box um, where you're from. But if you can go ahead and just indicate which of the following best describes where you work. A, culturally specific domestic violence and or sexual assault program. B, a non-culturally specific DV and or SA program. C, if you're with a community-based organization that's not primarily focused on DVSA. D, with a legal services organization. E, if you're with a healthcare organization. F, with an educational institution. Or G, other. Um, so if you go ahead and just uh, click on A through G, we would greatly appreciate it. And what's coming up so far indicates that about 35% of you all are with culturally specific DVNSA organizations and about 46% non-culturally specific DVNSA. And then we have some folks as well from community-based organizations, legal services, and other. Great. Well, thank you very much. And we hope that this information is, is, is helpful to everyone as we proceed. Um, so moving on, one moment. Let me see if we click back here. Uh, Jose Juan gave you a little bit of an overview of Casa Esperanza, but just wanted to share with you how Casa Esperanza is celebrating actually our 35th year anniversary this year of our direct services program in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, a group of Latina women had set up a refugio, a shelter, for Latina women in Minnesota 35 years ago. And over time, that program has really evolved to also include a lot more holistic services, community engagement, mo work with youth, mobilizing of men as allies and community leaders. And our mission is to mobilize Latino communities to end domestic violence, recognizing it's really the community that's going to end domestic violence, not any system or shelter or organization. So it's about how do we emphasize developing that social capital the trust, the information, the collaborations that can help decrease domestic violence and, and, and improve uh, the community's well-being. And then about uh, since 2009, Casa Esperanza really launched also the National Latino Network for Healthy Families and Communities, which is a national resource center focused on enhancing access to services for Latino communities and immigrants and really all survivors. We work as part of the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. And the main elements of the National Latino Network are training and technical assistance, public policy, research, and communications. So please consider us a resource, an ongoing resource of support in any way uh, that, that we can be a support to your you know, tremendous work on the ground. So moving on, and as I go into the, the presentation itself, as Jose Juan mentioned, there is a chat box on the bottom right corner. So feel free to type in a question. I may not get to that question right away, but we can collect questions and then I'll pause in between different sections and see if there are any particular questions that we can answer at this time or answer in a follow-up. So in terms of some background and overview, I really love this image. Uh, it comes from Tapestry, a program that works with immigrants, diverse group of immigrants in Atlanta, Georgia, and Julia Perilla, uh, who also had been uh, the head of our research initiative at National Latino Network, did a lot of work with Tapestry. And, and it helped develop this. And it really symbolizes, you know, the galaxy of an individual. When an individual comes to our program seeking assistance, information, trying to discern what to do, it's really important that we all keep in mind that while we play, you know, one role as a service, you know, social service agency organization, all the different myriad of factors that influence that individual from the family of origin and their children, their partner, their in-laws, going out to the community they're in, a faith community they might be connected to, their work, school, what's happening in the courts and with the police at the local level. You know, many people ask us for recommendation on, uh, on steps that immigrant survivors can take to enhance their safety, but a lot of that right now is also very relevant to what's happening in your local jurisdiction in terms of 
policies of the police, the policies of the courts, all of these different factors in local community that play such a key role, as well as then we're looking at the specific state laws, immigration laws, federal laws, things like BAWA, and then ultimately the outer circle, all the different ways in which an individual's either ethnicity, sexual orientation, race, gender, culture, all these also play an important factor as we look at the intersection. So there is, of course, as we know, no one, uh, you know, no one person that represents a typical survivor. It's really how do we meet each individual where they are at and really be there and hear from them what their priorities are, what their needs are, what their interests are, and how to support them in that process. Now, as we know, working with any survivor of domestic or sexual violence, it's, just, it's, just, it's such a, you know, they, they encounter so many different challenges. But yet, just want to call out with working with immigrant survivors, the additional barriers. And, and you all know this, I won't belabor it, but just important to keep that in mind that, you know, understanding the U.S. legal system can be complex for anyone, but when we add into that, not only the lack of knowledge of the U.S. legal system, but the fact that oftentimes immigrants are given misinformation intentionally about the legal system. Oftentimes an abuser, right, using that as a tool of abuse to tell an immigrant that they don't have any rights because they are immigrants and to really um, try and create increased fear and alienation and isolation. Also we know, for example, in communities there are what are called notarios, and in Latin America, uh, in Latin America, a notario is the equivalent of an attorney. But as we know, in the U.S., a notary, a notary public, is nowhere near an attorney. There's someone that just has a right to witness someone's signature. But there are people who intentionally will hang up their shingles, put their, some, themselves out there as a notario, and give a lot of misinformation and take money from vulnerable immigrant communities. So keeping in mind how important it is for us to share information of what people's rights are and make sure they're connected to, to reputable resources and support um, in light of both the misinformation by abusers and by others in community. You know, another additional barrier is the fear of the police and judicial systems and of deportation, of fear of losing the children. And those fears come from what's happening right now in many communities, but also from their experiences in their country of origin in which uh, oftentimes government resources or police or military were not to be trusted and, and in times were the source of abuse. So we're dealing with both those layers of, of the fears, that very real fears that an individual brings to their decision whether to engage with the criminal legal system, with, with other systems. Um, language access, which we're going to be talking about a little bit today and a lot more on October 24th, is a significant additional barrier. And it's an opportunity for all of us to say what are our own organizations doing to make sure that our services are fully accessible for an individual with limited English proficiency, but also what are we doing to make sure that services in our community, especially police, courts, hospitals, how do we do systems advocacy around language access issues, which will help not only the survivors we're working with, but the much larger community. Um, and then other barriers like discrimination, economic and employment challenges, and the isolation from family and community, among others. But as we list barriers, sometimes we get stuck there, and we don't want to get stuck there. We really want to celebrate and lift up the importance of strength-based advocacy. You know, what does that mean to then acknowledge that despite all those barriers we listed and more, when an immigrant survivor comes forward and reaches out to your organization, like how do we celebrate and lift up her courage, her strength to overcome those challenges and want to seek a pathway to safety and well-being for herself and her children? And though I am saying herself, you know, also acknowledging that, that, that men are victims at times of DVSA, also acknowledging the LGBTQ community, making sure our services are accessible to the wide array um, of individuals in need of our services. And, and then when that, per, you know, when that survivor comes forward, asking her what are her goals, what are her priorities, being careful that we're not imposing our own idea of how someone has to pursue, you know, pursue their own pathway to safety, um, but making sure we acknowledge that there are a lot of other needs, a lot of other fears that are very real, and how to work with them then in, in what would be an enhanced safety plan and a more comprehensive plan, taking that into consideration. And also, particularly with immigrant survivors, understanding and building the community resources and the networks, because many times it's more complex for immigrant survivors to access mainstream services, mainstream public benefits, public housing. You know, how do we connect those who can be connected to those services, but how do we make sure that we ourselves are aware of and helping build up community resource networks 
for, for immigrant survivors. And in so doing, also strengthen community engagement and really also putting tools in the hands of community for prevention. And you know, one of the things that we really at Casa Esperanza National Latino Network have seen is how important promotoras are. You know, promotoras are, are people out in the community. They may be community health workers, people who, who are trusted in the community, know the language, come from that community. And by building their capacity to share information and resources and make referrals, that really increases tremendously the way you can impact uh, these communities and, and really be available. So also in terms of a brief overview, looking at Latinas and Latinos in the U.S., um, certainly we're going to talk about immigrant survivors in the larger context, but I wanted to also frame with regard to the Latino community, you know, recognizing that there's approximately, approximately 56 million Latinas and Latinos living in the U.S., about 17% of the population. And even though it's seen as a category Latina or Hispanic, recognizing that really it's not homogenous. These are heterogeneous groups with varied histories, socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural and linguistic subtleties in the language that we need to be aware of from 22 or more countries of origin, depending how you count it. So while recognizing the Latino community, realizing also the diversity within the Latino community. And I hear this is also an important statistic just to recognize that a Approximately 34.4% of Latinos in the U.S. are foreign-born, meaning almost 66% are born in the U.S. of Latino or Hispanic heritage. So that's the other thing, you know, how not to make assumptions when we encounter someone regarding uh, whether they are recent immigrants or, or whether, in fact, they're U.S. citizens born here. And, and you know, asking questions in a culturally sensitive way um, without making assumptions. And at the same time, realizing that many families have mixed status. So, for example, you might be working with a survivor who's an immigrant who might have temporary status or legal permanent residency, or maybe she's undocumented. But her children, if they were born here, are U.S. citizens. So keeping in mind that about 75% of children in immigrant families are U.S. citizens. And recognizing that, for example, if the immigrant survivor herself doesn't qualify for public housing because of her immigration status, her children may because they are U.S. citizens and can get prorated assistance for public housing. So keeping those different issues in mind um, of, of those complexities. And then overall in 2015, about 45% of immigrants currently in the U.S., so it's about 19.5 million people, report having Hispanic or, or Latino origins. So obviously we have a very wide array of, uh, of the remaining 55% representing many other countries and parts of the world. And then this is also just a brief overview that I want us to keep in mind when we're talking about immigration status, that it really is something that is quite fluid. And I've pulled out six main categories, and there are many other categories as well. I just wanted to sort of frame it so we keep in mind that even amongst those who are immigrants, about 20 million of the 43 million immigrants in this country are naturalized citizens already, so they have all rights and responsibilities of, of, of citizens. They're fully citizens. That's about 48% of immigrants. Um, and then another group are those who are legal permanent residents, which some people refer to as green cards, even though the card stopped being green a long time ago. Um, people still know it as the green card that has legal permanent residency status. But after approximately on average five years of being a legal permanent resident, someone can take the citizenship test and have to pass a language test and apply to become a naturalized citizen. So those are individuals on the pathway to a potential to become U.S. citizens. Uh, another category are the categories of unauthorized immigrants or undocumented. That is roughly approximately 11 million. And I'll just pause here just to remind us all that, um, that the term illegal alien is a term that is so dehumanizing that I think part of our uh, community engagement and advocacy in our communities is to really encourage people to, you know, not to use those terms in any way. A human being is never illegal. And the term alien, unfortunately, is uh, enshrined in statute with the uh, Immigration Nationalities Act that refers to aliens. And yet I think if I ask you, you know, for a moment to close your eyes and say, what do you think of when you hear the word alien? I don't know about you, but to me, it's, I sometimes see a little green head with multiple eyes and a number of antennas. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a term that also can you know, dehumanize individuals. And we know what happens when humans are dehumanized. 
the way that then society might treat them and not treat them with the human dignity and the human rights they deserve. So um, I think our language is so important and using the language of uh, unauthorized or undocumented immigrants and recognizing, as we're going to see here, how it is very fluid. Um, another category are refugee arrivals. Uh, the U.S. admitted 85,000 refugees in fiscal year 16, as we've heard now, that number is being scaled down, which, um, which raises a lot of concerns, knowing that there are a lot of immigrants who are fleeing persecution. And along with refugees are those seeking asylum, which are those who enter the country uh, seeking essentially protection for fleeing persecution. And we have seen over the past few years a significant increase, particularly from uh, three countries in Central America, um, that were, where people are fleeing high levels of violence from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, very closely linked with the problems of drug cartels and gangs, and a lot of, uh, a lot of women and with their children fleeing horrific levels of sexual violence, domestic violence, high levels of feminicide, and recognize that those individuals are actually wouldn't be categorized as immigrants per se, but more asylees, people seeking protection, fleeing persecution. Um, so that's a very important category uh, of individuals um, that we need to be, especially in our movement, looking out for and making sure that they have a pathway to safety and to be able to get the, the services and support they need to pursue asylum claims. Um, and then others are temporary legal residents. Now what's interesting is a lot of people come to the country every year to the U.S. with student and worker visas, um, or, and, and many times those who are undocumented are not individuals who actually entered the country without status, but rather individuals who had temporary status and then overstayed that status. Uh, so let me give you an example so we can see the fluidity of this. Let's say someone comes as a student. They have a student visa. They enter the country that way and are studying, and then meet someone, fall in love, and get married. So when their student visa has expired, by virtue of their being married, let's say to someone who's a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident, that individual can petition for them as their spouse. But as we see oftentimes in domestic violence situations, what greater tool of power and control than to leave someone in undocumented status? So we sometimes see that, that a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident who could petition for their spouse chooses not to. So that person who was a temporary legal resident, and looking here at my chart, Category 5, under student visa, all of a sudden now becomes, in Category 3 there, of an undocumented or unauthor unauthorized immigrant because their spouse did not petition for them. But let's say they are able to make their way to you after, you know, sadly suffering uh, abuse, they're referred to your organization, you meet with them, find out the situation, and because you're aware of special protection, say, wait, if you're married to a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident and are a victim of abuse, you can submit a VAWA self-petition. So you help them, connect them to the right resources to apply for that, and that individual then is able to get legal status and ultimately become a legal permanent resident and then over after a period of time transition to become a naturalized citizen. So that's just an example of how in that one hypothetical someone could go through a myriad of different categories and, and it really is, is quite fluid. Um, the sixth category that I have here is those who are, have deferred action, which is not like, for example, those individuals on the U visa wait list have deferred action. They don't have yet. Uh, uh, a visa, and so they're not in, um, you know, full immigration status, but it's a protected status saying that they're, they are much less of a priority for any kind of an enforcement action while they have deferred action. Um, one of the categories, of course, that's in the news a lot right now are individuals who had gotten deferred action as childhood arrivals, and as I'm sure you all are aware, there have been changes in that policy where that, that status is not going to be terminated um, as of March 5th, unless Congress passes legislation to create a pathway for these individuals. So that's something I, I'm going to talk a little bit further about later, but I want us to keep in mind, if you're aware of any immigrant survivors who may currently have DACA status, as it's referred to, and there really is a need to work with them and do enhanced safety planning and, and be aware of how this is changing. And so again, just to say how immigration uh, issues can be very complex, because oftentimes they do change. Okay. But overall, what I want to leave us as a sort of overarching comprehensive framework as we move forward in these, is recognizing that regardless of someone's immigration status or not, whether they're a citizen or not, 
really what we're talking about are human beings, and every human being has a right to live a life without the fear of, of domestic and sexual violence. So how do we approach this work from that kind of a human rights framework and making sure, making sure that their safety is central to any of the work that we're doing and then recognizing that that safety is unattainable unless we really practice cultural and linguistic competency, um, both at the individual level as advocates but also at the organizational level to make sure that our services are accessible and that we're able to provide advocacy uh, to, to immigrant survivors. And, you know, I think one of the things I want to just lift up again is recognizing that when that individual comes and reaches out to your program to say, wow, this is a huge opportunity to help not just that person, but when you help that person, word gets out in the community that this organization is there for us. And the converse is also true, and we've seen it happen many times, that if someone takes the courageous step despite all the challenges and reaches out for help and they go to a program where there isn't language access, where they sit there for days without anyone really being able to communicate with them, where they're not able to get the support they need, ultimately not only is that individual deprived of an opportunity to have a pathway to safety and maybe, maybe they could have even been able to get help through immigration relief, but we'll never know that if they don't have an advocate who can communicate and support them and create an environment uh, where they feel safe and where there's trust. But not only that, but then they go back in the community and say, that program's really not for us. Don't go there. So it has a chilling effect, and, and then it really dissuades a lot of other people from reaching out and getting the help they need. But when someone, in fact, is helped, that program then gets the reputation in the community, that it is a safe place, that it's a place where the people can come forward and so I think that's where we just have such an important opportunity, especially with the climate we're now in, to really create that relationship of trust and let, let immigrants in your community know that you're there for them. So this next part is about protections for immigrant survivors. And so what are some of the, the different legal protections that are available to immigrant survivors? You know, I want us to think real broadly. You know, we know VAWA, um, but really starting with the Constitution, Immigrants have constitutional rights to due process, rights against self-incrimination, and we're going to talk more about that on the webinar next week in terms of the Know Your Rights information when they have you know, the right to remain silent, the right to, uh, to you know, contact an attorney, and, and a number of other rights, the right to that someone cannot just walk into their home unless they have a search warrant signed by a judge. So we're going to talk more about that next week, but it's an important message to get out there that constitutional protections also protect uh, individuals regardless of immigration status. And then there are important federal laws, including civil rights laws of non-discrimination, laws around access to services that are necessary for life or safety. Of course, we're going to get a little, talk a little bit more about VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act laws. And then there are protections under FIPSA, the Family Violence Prevention Services Act that funds a lot of shelter and DV programs, VOCA, the Victims of Crime Act, and under the INA, the immigration laws. And then even other laws, like wage protection laws, keep in mind, if you find you know, a situation where, and this is not uncommon at all, where people exploit immigrants tremendously for their labor and then refuse to pay them at all or pay them sub uh, you know, wages that are even below the minimum wage, thinking they can get away with that because they don't think this immigrant has any rights, they do, even if they're in undocumented status. The wage protection laws protect, protect them as well, and you can connect them. To, uh, to, to perhaps legal aid resources or others that can assist them with that. There are also international laws, international treaties with regard to the treatment of refugees, and, and state laws. Keep in mind that your own state may have additional laws with regard to privilege and confidentiality, with regard to services that immigrants can access. So keeping a, a, a wide open mind and, and exploring all those different things in your own context. But we're going to talk now a little bit about what are some of the protections that were created in VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, and in TVPA, the Trafficking Victims Prevention Act. And I think, actually, Trafficking Victims Protection Act, to fix that. <laughs> and I think one of the things we really want to keep in mind here is that Congress created these protections in a bipartisan manner. And it was expressly, when you go back and you look at the legislative history and the findings in the statute itself, Congress recognized that abusers often exploit a victim's lack of immigration status as a tactic of abuse. Like the hypothetical I shared earlier, 
where the immigrant student marries someone who says, oh, yeah, you know, as my spouse, I'll be able to petition for you, but then chooses not to, or, or maybe submits the paperwork and then withdraws it and uses that as a tool of abuse to keep this person so fearful. Because imagine if someone's undocumented, how fearful they are to call the police, afraid of losing custody of their children, afraid of deportation, without work authorization, so just tremendous economic dependence. Um, you know, a myriad of things, unable to access public benefits. So Congress recognized that those with dependent status could be at risk if they were in an abusive situation and created these remedies. And has re in each reauthorization of VAWA, you know, from the original one in 94 where this was included to the reauthorizations in 2000, 2005, and 2013, these protections have been expanded and enhanced. And as we move forward, looking at VAWA 2018, it is with that same expectation that Congress, in a bipartisan manner, continue to do that. But really, it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that, you know, that we educate our representatives on how important these provisions and protections are to make sure all survivors have access to safety and well-being, regardless of immigration status. And also part of VAWA are some important confidentiality protections for immigrant survivors that we'll talk about a little bit more as well. So here's just a, a brief overview of some of the potential forms of immigration relief. Um, the VAWA self-petition, as, as we mentioned, but also a battered spouse waiver. So for example, if someone has married an individual who's a U.S. citizen or, or a legal permanent resident, and that person has gone ahead and petitioned for them, normally you must remain in that marriage, a good faith marriage, for a minimum of two years. You have a conditional protected status before then you can move uh, to, to lift the conditionality. But if someone's in an abusive situation, Congress recognized they shouldn't be forced for a two-year period to stay in an abusive marriage, and that's where um, the battered spouse waiver uh, can be very helpful. Uh, the U visa, which we'll talk a little bit more about, was created. That was created through the TVPA when VAWA was reauthorized in 2000 uh, jointly with the TVPA. The U visa was created recognizing that at times an individual is married is not married to their abuser, or if they are married, the abuser may not have U.S. citizen or, le or legal permanent residency status. So the U visa doesn't require marriage, doesn't, it's not based on the, the immigration status of the person who perpetrated the abuse, and it's focused on individuals who are crime victims, who are willing to help in the investigation or prosecution of a crime. The T visa was created also in 2000, um, and that's focused on trafficking victims. And then DACA is, has been a benefit, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival, but again here we want to call out that this is in transition, and if you know any immigrant survivors who are recipients of DACA, and there are a number who benefited from it because when DACA was put in place in 2012, it was eligible, those who were eligible were individuals brought to this country when they were children under the age of 16. And they had to be under the age of 31 in 2012 when DACA was created. So there were a lot of individuals um, who, who were able, who had been brought over as children who had been living continuously for five years prior to 2012 and who were under 31 who were able to get this deferred action. And right now there's about 800,000 approximate individuals who have DACA status who may potentially uh, lose that status status if Congress does not pass legislation uh, to keep this in place um, uh, by March 5th. So this is something very important if you're aware of individuals uh, impacted by this, and it's important for us also to share uh, with our representatives, just to educate them, share any stories you know of how these benefits are important for survivors or have been important. And then as we mentioned, uh, there are other defenses before an immigration judge to asylum uh, can be a defense and cancellation of removal and asylum also is something proactive that an individual can, can apply for. With asylum, the tricky thing is someone has to apply, generally speaking, within one year of coming to this country, um, and there's some limited exceptions. But that's why it's very important to make sure those individuals, like I mentioned, who are particularly fleeing high levels of domestic and sexual violence and maybe seeking asylum to connect them to uh, legal representation as soon as possible to help them. So this is a chart. I like this chart, and we'll send it to you all as a standalone. But this chart was created by the Department of Homeland Security as part of their blue campaign um, against trafficking. And so it's just a reminder to folks that these are remedies passed by Congress, uh, lifted up, and, and you know recognized and are important. 
you all play a huge critical important role to connect individuals to potentially access these remedies that are there to support victims of domestic sexual violence, stalking, trafficking. And we'll send you a chart that has a lot more detailed information as well. But these are the main ones uh, that we've already spoken about, a little bit about the VAWA self-petition, the U visa, and the T visa to keep in mind. Um, one of the important things I want to say about the U visa is the difference between the U visa and the VAWA self-petition. There are a few differences, right? One is, as we mentioned already before, the VAWA self-petition means that that individual married to a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident that because the person who could petition for them is not doing so, and, it's, and that's being used as a tool of abuse, it allows the survivor to self-petition. They submit that petition themselves directly to USCIS, the U.S. Citizen Immigration Services. And it goes to a special unit, the Vermont Service Center, that has adjudicators specifically trained on domestic and sexual violence and trafficking issues. And we're going to talk about the confidentiality then that comes with that. Um, but there are other categories, too. It could be that the child of U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident is the one who's the victim of abuse or stepchildren, um, and, and their mother can also be part of that petition as well. The VAWA self-petition is also available for a parent of adult U.S. citizen sons or daughters. So sometimes individuals who become U.S. citizens here later send for their parents from another country, and, and there were some cases recognizing elder abuse, and they could petition for their parents but had not done so, and parents can self-petition, so they're not trapped in an abusive situation under those circumstances as well. Uh, so keep in mind that there's some of these additional categories for VAWA self-petition. Um, and if someone divorces their U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident spouse, they still, within a two-year period, could file a VAWA self-petition. Sometimes people think that because someone got divorced, they're no longer eligible. But um, we can, send, you know, the, the chart I send will send more information about that. So always keep it in mind to seek uh, individuals who have expertise on these different remedies and know who to refer them, um, attorneys that can help them, or advocates themselves can become certified representatives through the BIA, um, which which enables them to do advocacy on immigration cases in particular. And we can send more information about BIA certification in case your organization or advocates in your organization are interested in more in-depth training uh, to be able to represent at a deeper level um, those individuals who are immigrant survivors that could qualify for, for different remedies. Um, in terms of the U visa, one of the critical parts of the U visa is that it does, it is, it was created for individuals who are victims of designated crimes, including domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking actually was added in VAWA 2013, um, and a range of other crimes. We'll send you the sheet that lists all the different qualifying crimes. It, but for the U visa, they do need a certification that shows that they are or are willing to be helpful in the investigation or prosecution of one of the designated crimes. We call this the U visa certification. Oftentimes it's law enforcement uh, that individuals turn to to certify their eligibility to apply. But just keep in mind that it, it's not limited to law enforcement. It can be child protective services if the survivor is assisting in the investigation of CPS. Um, it could be the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, in a labor case. Um, or where there's been sexual exploitation, sexual violence in the workplace. Uh, so there are a range of, it could be a judge or prosecutor, there are a range of individuals that can certify for the U visa. And there are some important resources and manuals for how you can you know, do advocacy in your community and make sure that these individuals understand how important the U visa is. And ultimately it's discretionary whether they want to certify, but that's where the system's advocacy, the collaborative, you know, coordinated community response to really lift up how when Congress created the U visa, it was both to assist in the investigation and prosecution of crimes, recognizing that it undermines public safety as well when victims are, are too afraid to come forward, but also from a humanitarian perspective to create a pathway to safety for undocumented individuals who are uh, oftentimes experiencing higher levels of exploitation or abuse because of their undocumented status and because those who, who prey upon them figure that, that they are going to be too afraid to go to the police. So the U visa um, has this dual purpose, and, and it's important to make sure that, 
that law enforcement or others in your community understand their important role in certifying. Now, the other thing I want to say about the U visa uh, is that there is a cap of only 10,000 U visas a year. So this has been challenging. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, understanding from and, and, you know, hearing from the voices of advocates and attorneys around the country that this cap is not meeting the, the tremendous need to help victims. And so that's, that's another important area for education. But presently, there's also a huge backlog in the processing of U visas. And so we do get questions about this. So, for example, right now USCIS is processing U visa applications from August of 2014. So we're talking a backlog of about three years. And this is very problematic because one of the things about the, the U visa cap, even when the cap of 10,000 is reached on an annual basis, individuals found eligible for a U visa can be put on a wait list. And while they're on a wait list, they can get deferred action. Remember I mentioned deferred action earlier. And they can also get work authorization at that point. But the challenge we have is because there is a significant backlog right now of adjudication is that there is a three-year wait before someone can even get on the wait list if they're eligible and get work authorization. So these are some of the things that we're also uh, trying to educate policymakers about to try to get um, expedited access to work authorization and trying to get more adjudicators to move these cases uh, along so that hopefully they could be processed within a six-month time frame, which is what it used to be. Um, and then the T visa has a cap of about, well, not about, it is a cap of 5,000 T visas a year. That cap is not reached annually. It has not been reached. But interestingly, a lot of actually victims of trafficking oftentimes end up filing for a U visa instead of a T visa because a U visa also covers trafficking. The T visa covers victims of severe forms of trafficking that are physically, who are physically present in the U.S. on account of that trafficking. So it has an extra element of having to prove that their presence is on account of the trafficking itself, um, whereas the U visa doesn't require that, that uh, evidentiary proof of being in the U.S. present on account of trafficking, which is why sometimes it's because of those complexities of proving that they pursue a U visa instead of a T visa. Uh, but the T visa, once an individual gets a T visa, they are treated as if they are a refugee and are actually entitled to a lot more in terms of services, public benefits that a U visa recipient is not eligible for. Um, but it's important then to, to have someone talk through uh, different forms of immigration benefits or relief to try and discern based on different issues what might be best for someone to pursue. So again, we'll send some additional resources. There are a lot of um, good resources online for more information. And, and the, the key role of advocates here is not necessarily to be complete experts on all of these, but to know how to flag them, to know how to make sure that you're screening for the potential and connecting any immigrant survivor who might potentially qualify for immigration remedies to someone who's trained in this who can, who can assist them in the process of further screening and, and with submitting uh, applications. And once uh, someone does submit an application, for example, for a VAWA, a T, or a U, that goes into the database of the Department of Homeland Security. There's a special flag that they are an applicant for these remedies, and that does bring extra protection in terms of issues of VAWA confidentiality, confidentiality protections that are enshrined in, in VAWA in the statute. And there's three key aspects to, to VAWA confidentiality. The first one is non-disclosure. Uh, so that protects victims who have filed for, let's say, the VAWA self-petition, but they might be very afraid. They might say to you, no, I'm afraid of submitting that because if my husband calls and asks them if I filed something and finds out that I did, I will get you know, beaten badly. I could, and, and, and so oftentimes someone filing for a VAWA self-petition may continue living with the abuser just because their circumstances are so limited not having work authorization, not being able to access public benefits, you know, the myriad of challenges that oftentimes they might stay with the abuser and then they don't want the abuser to know that they have submitted that self-petition. So luckily, VAWA confidentiality protects them and tells the Department of Homeland Security that they cannot disclose to anyone who calls and making, makes inquiries um, as to whether this person has filed a self-petition. And there's some limited exceptions, for example, for public benefits. So if I was a self-petitioner who, who gets a prima facie determination that, that they are eligible, 
they can then apply for public benefits and pursue public housing. And if there needs to, those entities can do through a special process, they can verify that this individual, in fact, uh, has a VAWA self-petition or a prima facie case. So there are some specific protected ways, but generally speaking, there's, no, there's, a, there's a general non-disclosure protection. The other way that the confidentiality protections are helpful is it says that Department of Homeland Security cannot use information solely provided by abusers or their families to take enforcement action against someone. So sadly, that's very common where, for example, let's say someone is bringing uh, criminal charges for rape against uh, an individual, and that individual's family then may decide, well, let me call, let me notify ICE that they're undocumented and try to get them deported so that they can't go to court, um, or that individual themselves or a family member. So ICE cannot act on information provided solely by an abuser, and that, that, that is very critical um, protection. And there are, you know, for anyone who violates that, there are fines and disciplinary action as well. Um, and then finally, there are some location prohibitions that protect victims. Um, so for example, uh, if someone's in the midst of a custody action and the abuser notifies ICE, and we've seen this happen, We've seen cases like this where they notify ICE and say, my spouse, you know, my, you know, this person is going to be in court on such and such a date and gives them the information. They're there for a custody case, for example, hoping that they'll get deported so that they can then get custody of the kids. That's the kind of thing that ICE cannot act on uh, information in, in those places, in those sensitive locations, unless they have complied with VAWA confidentiality. The notice to appear, if they were to conduct any such action, would have to state that they complied with VAWA confidentiality, um, including not relying on, on tips of abusers. So these are all very important uh, confidentiality protections. And it applies, I listed here, a range of immigration options for crime victims and their children. And the ones in red are the ones that have extra VAWA confidentiality at attached to them. So deferred action for childhood arrival doesn't, asylum doesn't, or in special immigrant juvenile status does not. But the other forms of, of VAWA relief and U and T visa does have special confidentiality protections. And as I mentioned as well, that enforcement actions aren't to be taken at the following locations unless ICE can certify in writing that they complied with VAWA confidentiality. Um, okay. and, and next week we are going to talk more about safety planning issues and shelter safety planning and some of the other questions that arise around that. So if anyone, I'm going to pause there, if anyone has any specific questions, uh, feel free to write them in the chat box. If not, I'll, I'll continue. Um, and JJ, you can interrupt me if you see any particular questions that, that may have come up before regarding what I have covered. Um, but otherwise, in the interest of time, I will continue moving forward and just, you know, a lot of the questions that we're getting now are questions from people wanting to know what is changing in terms of immigration policy, in terms of immigration enforcement policies. Uh, people see a lot of things um, in the news. And again, you know, it, it can create a lot of confusion and uncertainty, not only for immigrant survivors, but for advocates as well and for community leaders. Um, so it is important for us to help share information with the community, but also we don't want to create uh, unnecessary fear or apprehension as well. We want to make sure that uh, immigrants know that there are a range of, of, of services available for them and rights and protections available for them as well. Um, Rosie? Uh, yes. So there's a couple of questions. Um, okay. Is is there a special form for victims to apply for benefits? That's the first question. And another question is, how can I get a hard copy of information and webinar? Um, okay. So we will be, uh, Laurel, we will be actually um, sending a copy of the PowerPoints um, in the next couple of days. So everyone will be receiving a copy of the PowerPoint. So yeah, so April's yes, question thanks was. thanks for the question. Yes. Yeah. So, so benefits, yeah, benefits, as you can imagine, are complex, um, and, it, and it really, deter, you know, really it depends on whether someone is considered, quote, unquote, you know, a qualified alien for the purposes of receiving benefits. Um, 
and I, I put it in quotes because, again, that's a, an actual term in, in the statute, and, and it depends on their immigration status. But, for example, uh, someone who's, who, under the VAWA self-petition, if they're married to, for example, a U.S. citizen spouse, they get an initial determination that's called a prima facie determination that, that indicates that they appear to meet all the eligibility requirements. And with that, in many states, they can seek public benefits. Um, whereas, on the other hand, for example, with the U visa, the U visa does not grant access to federal public benefits. What it, the U visa is supposed to uh, grant access to work authorization and, and and once the, the individual is, you know, found to be eligible for a U visa, um, they get work authorization, but, but not public benefits. So, so it really depends. And then the other thing is that it also is different by states. States also, some states have allocated their own state resources to create access to benefits uh, for immigrants. But the other thing, and I am going to talk about this a little bit further on in the webinar, is there are some general services that do need to be made available to all regardless of immigration status. And those are uh, services necessary for life or safety. So I'm going to go a little bit more in depth into that. But in the follow-up materials, as JJ said, we will send you all the webinar PowerPoint, and we will send links to additional information and resources. And one of those uh, is about public benefits. So I'll make sure that we include that link. And then also uh, NUWAP, the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project, has an entire manual on public benefits and webinars of several hours just on public benefits. So we can also send you the link to that as well. Rosie, I have a couple of more questions. Um, so this might be part of the safety planning side, but uh, should someone apply for a U visa of some kind, um, do they have to disclose to their abuser? Do they have to disclose to their abuser? That's one question. And then the other question is, um, what is the way we could help undocumented uh, immigrants in the um, was not custodial parent, but the other parent is uh, has legal status? How can we help okay. them? Great, great. So in terms of the U visa, so the U visa is for a, you know a victim of crime, as we mentioned, who is willing to help in the investigation or prosecution of a crime. So when they're coming forward, inevitably. You know, if they know the name of their abuser, in order to report a crime, they would need to give them, you know, any information they have about the perpetrator of that crime. So that's why it is very important for safety planning to go along with that and to make sure that, you know, in talking with a survivor, you know, they understand, you know, A, are, are they, do they want to pursue criminal legal action against the abuser, you know, B, in, in uh, you know, if they do, letting them know, many times you know, someone might say, yes, I do, but I'm so afraid that if I go to the police, I'm going to get deported, because many times there's that fear, and that's what abusers have said to them. And that's why the U visa is a remedy to say, well, you know, and there's no guarantee, but you can say to them, well, you know, there is a, a remedy called the U visa for someone who is willing to assist in the investigation of a crime, that if you are eligible and if law enforcement certifies, you know, your cooperation, you may potentially be eligible for it. Um, and that's one factor they can consider in deciding whether they want to, uh, you know, pursue the U visa. Or, or per, but, but the reality is that, again, you know, even certification is not mandatory. Part of that also requires some advocacy sometimes on the part of advocates to explain to law enforcement that if someone has come forward and is taking risks in so doing, um, to that, you know, why it is important to provide them this pathway to safety and, and to certify their cooperation to pursue a U visa. But um, it is something that, you know, safety planning uh, may need to be done around that because inevitably then if the police are going to turn to the, you know, and, and pursue charges against the abuser, uh, it will be known that, that they were, you know, bringing charges against them. Uh, so all, all these things are complex and require that the person really thinking through, uh, you know, their safety and, and, and different pathways forward. Um, in terms of an undocumented immigrant, and again, I really, we really do want to encourage people not to talk about illegal immigrants um, because if the term illegal conveys, and I know it's hard, we all hear it, so I'm not calling out, but I think, you know, we all hear it in society and we hear it in the media, um, but that's part of sort of, I think, the, the, the shift and the paradigm of a human rights framework. But in looking at an immigrant who's undocumented or, or unauthorized in their immigration status, 
they still are eligible to get custody of their children. The standards that a judge should be using in a family court case is what is in the best interest of the child. And, and there have been cases, you know, that have, you know, gone up to, you know, to the highest level of, the, of you know, state courts, to the Supreme Courts, uh, indicating, you know, why it's so important not to hold a parent's immigration status against them in that determination. Um, and, and recognizing that at times, you know, the abuser has used that as a tool of abuse. So it's important that they have, you know, assistance and representation, knowing that the abuser may try to undermine their access to custody based on immigration status. Um, but, but it's important that, that that not be used against them in a custody determination. Uh, uh, and also a point of clarification, Rosie, if the undocumented uh, survivor has an open case with DHS, they can, uh, they can assist in the application certification for a visa? So the certification, so for example, for the U visa, the certification comes from the law enforcement entity or other investigative entity that can corroborate that they, in fact, are, you know, are willing to assist and cooperate in the investigation of, a, of an eligible crime. So there's a form called an I-918 that someone needs to use to apply for the U visa, and attached to that application and their own affidavit would be this certification from, and again, it could be law enforcement, prosecution, judge, CPS, that certifies that that individual um, is helpful or is willing to be helpful in the investigation or prosecution of that crime. And those are the, the, you know, that along with some other things comprise the packet that would be sent to the Vermont Service Center, which is part of DHS, the part of the U.S. Citizen Information Services, to decide um, if they meet all the different eligibility requirements. There's also, you know, biometrics will be done. If there's a prior criminal history, they need to apply for specific waivers. Um, and we see that sometimes, right? We see that criminal history... Uh, that some survivors themselves at times are uh, prosecuted for, you know, incidents that may really be tied to the abuse itself. Um, for example, victims of trafficking may be prosecuted for prostitution, and then when they, they may be fearful to apply for a visa, saying, well, I have a past criminal history. So it's important that there are waivers of that. So the, the, the application process entails a number of different steps, but that certification is one part of it, and then ultimately, uh, Department of Homeland Security through the U.S. Citizen Immigration Services is the one that adjudicates whether they are eligible for the U visa. And if someone is granted the U visa, once they finally get the visa, the visa is good for four years. And at the three-year mark, they can actually apply to adjust to become legal permanent residents. Um, but there is a, a manual that explains a lot more about U visa, U visa certification. So we will be including that with the follow-up materials to this presentation. Um, where you can learn more about the UVs and the different crimes. Rosie, one more question before we move on, because I'm keeping time here also. Um, huh? So as we know, there's a lot of filing fees. It can be very significant and costly financially for applicants. Are there any resources that advocates can provide to assist survivors who aren't able to pay some of these fees? Because in addition to the filing fees to apply for these type of visas, there's also maybe um, uh, like uh, criminal record fees and all of of all those kinds. Right, right. No, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. And I think a lot of that, you know, might be specific to your local community or your state in terms of, you know, organizations that might be able to, to help individuals with fees. One example, for example, recently with DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, people to renew those, there was a, a fee of $500 and recognizing that, that those fees could uh, impede someone from applying different funds were set up to help immigrants uh, in being able to get resources. And like you said, having to do, you know, fingerprint checks and other, th and other things. Um, so there are, you know, different communities resources, but that's something that, that's an important piece of, of systems advocacy as well, is, is to try and, and, and figure out what kinds of resources are available in communities. Uh, for, some of the, for some of the applications, there are fee waivers. Um, but for others, there aren't. So that's the kind of thing. When we send you the chart, um, you can, you know, look into the, you can see which ones are eligible for fee waivers, and then, and then the ones that aren't, see what resources are available in the local community. Um, so in the interest of time, let me 
move a little bit forward on this, but thank you for all your questions. So um, one more so question. I'm not breaking my own rules here, Rosie, but <laughs> um, as far as like all these forms of application, you mentioned that uh, does it require an attorney to have like the U visa, for example, to process any of these forms? So what's important is it, it, it doesn't uh, require per se, but one has to be very cautious, especially with cases that are complicated, especially when there is any prior criminal history, when anyone might already have a prior removal order, um, if they had already uh, in, in a, on a prior occasion been deported or had, or had entered uh, without inspection. So the thing is, you know, when one is filing, for example, for the U visa, you're giving a lot of information to Department of Homeland Security and, and want to make sure that, you know, a thorough assessment has been done of the different factors um, to take into consideration when applying for this. So it is advisable that you be able to refer them to attorneys who have experience with this. There are also pro bono attorneys that have gone through trainings. Or, like I mentioned, the BIA, the Board of Immigration Appeals, does have a process where advocates can become certified. And, and literally then they are given permission to, to represent um, immigrants with, with specific cases. And so OVW, the Office of Violence Against Women, does provide a grant, for example, to CLINIC. CLINIC is the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, and they do some trainings throughout the year if advocates want to learn much more in depth how to do advocacy on these issues and receive a certification which would enable them uh, to provide essentially representation. It's not considered an authorized practice of law because you do get a BIA certification uh, to assist with these cases and have someone that can help mentor. So we'll send out more information about the BIA certification. But I think it's really important for DV and SA programs, community-based organizations, and others to identify who are the resources in your community through legal aid, through other programs, through immigration legal resource centers, um, through pro bono projects. Identify who are those resources in your community so that you can refer people to that. Thank you, Rosie. Good, good questions. Um, so looking at the current climate, as we know, there have been some executive orders, new ones that were put out on immigration issues that came out in January and new guidance that was issued by Department of Homeland Security. And I'm not going to go in depth into those. You'll see there is a link there to Hiri Justice Center did do a document sort of reviewing what the implications are potentially for survivors. But generally, just to give a brief overview, uh, some of the, the changes are that it does revive what's known as the Secure Communities Program. And essentially what this program is, and it's in every jurisdiction across the country, what it is is that when an individual is fingerprinted, um, when they are taken into custody by, by law enforcement, those fingerprints are shared not only with the FBI, but they also go to the ICE database. And if an individual is in the system, um, as being in the country with unauthorized status, then, then ICE has a, essentially what's called a hit. They know that that person has been detained. And then ICE can issue what's called a detainer request where they ask local law enforcement to hold those individuals for an extra 48 hours uh, in case ICE wants to come and take them into ICE custody. Um, so I'm sure you may have heard quite a bit in the news, you know, with regard to that, with regard to issues of detainers. There have been a number of different lawsuits as well where some, you know, a number of jurisdictions have said, have said, you know, we don't have the authority to hold someone those extra 48 hours when they already are free to go when a judge has um, ordered, you know, when they've completed their time or the judge has ordered that they be released. And a number of cases have, in fact, you know, found that there isn't um, authority to continue to hold them those 48 hours. But there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of litigation going on around the whole issue of detainers, um, as you may have, have seen uh, in the news. But the important thing to keep in mind is, you know, the real risk, for example, for survivors. If they are arrested, and we know that happens sometimes with immigrant survivors where there may be a dual arrest, especially if there isn't adequate language access with the police, and they end up potentially just arresting both of them, that this could put uh, an immigrant survivor at risk if she's fingerprinted and that information is sent to ICE, even if ultimately no charges are brought against her um, and, and if she's released. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, it's very important to get engaged in community advocacy, very important for, you know, 
every effort to try and prevent dual arrest, to make sure police know how to do primary aggressor determinations, to make sure there's adequate language access. Um, the other thing that is revived are what are called 287G agreements under the Immigration Nationalities Act. And essentially what a 287G agreement is, is that it allows local law enforcement, if they choose to enter into a special agreement with the Department of Homeland Security, where essentially local law enforcement is deputized to serve also as immigration agents and sort of play a dual role. And, and that has also, a lot of communities have raised concerns about that, about concerns about increased entanglement between local law enforcement and federal immigration enforcement, um, that it can, you know, potentially have a chilling effect for immigrant victims and witnesses to come forward if they see um, that there is increased entanglement between local law enforcement and federal immigration enforcement. So it's something that a lot of communities, again, it's an opportunity for those who work with DVSA survivors to, to you know, be able to share um, why it is important to have community trust policies and to make sure that victims and witnesses feel that they can come forward to seek law enforcement help. Um, there has been uh, efforts, our efforts to take away some federal funding from what have been termed, quote, sanctuary jurisdictions. A lot of that is, is under litigation. I'm not going to go further into that here, but there are a number of, of different resources around that as well. Um, Again, also calls for more immigration agents and more interior enforcement, and essentially increased fines and penalties for those unlawfully present. So it is the current enforcement policies are casting a much broader net on priorities for removal, for deportation. And as we know, um, that has, you know, has raised a lot, of, uh, a lot of concern in different communities as to what the impact of that is. So, I also have here in this next chart that the you know, Department of Homeland Security put out an implementation memo in February. One of the concerns is that it says that it does away with a lot of former memos on prosecutorial discretion, but I do want to call out that as far as we know, there is a memo on prosecutorial discretion for victims and witnesses. This is a memo that ICE put out in 2011 that said that immigration agents should not take action against immigrant victims and witnesses or those pursuing meritorious civil rights claims, you know, unless there are extraordinary factors at play that make them a risk um, or make them a high priority, but that otherwise they should exercise discretion and not sweep victims and witnesses into this broader net. We have been requesting of the Department of Homeland Security to affirm whether this memo is still in effect. Um, we have not received anything in writing, but we, you know, Folks from DHS have said that at this point that memo is still in effect. So that is one of the resources we'll also email to you all as, as follow-up resources to have that memo um, for your own systems advocacy in your local community. Um, but essentially, the priorities now include, say, that it includes those convicted or charged with any criminal offense or who've committed any act that constitutes a chargeable offense. So there is a lot of... Um, concern that that is quite broad and who could, you know, potentially get swept up into that. But individuals who do appear most at risk for deportation and removal are those who are already in detention or jail, those who have a, a past criminal history. Um, so again, the U visa, for example, does have some waivers of inadmissibility if they're a victim of crime, so that's where it is important to make sure that they are connected, you know, with, with someone who knows about the UVs and about these waivers to assist anyone who has uh, a, a criminal history that could be detrimental. Um, and those who have been ordered deported in the past um, or, or have forfeited any appeals are also at much greater risk of removal. So for example, if you have an immigrant survivor who says to you, I, you know, I received a deportation order, but they have allowed me to continue to stay in the country, because there are a number of individuals that because they were not considered a high priority for removal, they just need to check in once a year with the Department of Homeland Security. And they may say to you, you know, for the past three years I have just always gone and checked in. It's not a problem. Well, that, that potentially could be changing now. And we have heard of situations where individuals who in the past just had to check in once a year um, now could be, you know, put on the pathway to deportation. So, again, people under, with those situations should see uh, an immigration attorney and should have someone who would accompany them 
when they're going to go to do their check-in with the Department of Homeland Security and make sure to have the equities on file, to have the information on file about ways in which uh, they have been impacted as immigrants of, of, of violence and, um, and other special, we'll talk a little bit more about that next week with, with enhanced safety planning of how to, you know, help assemble the information that can help with the advocacy uh, to, to, to try and prevent their, their deportation to get a cancellation of removal. But one of the things we are hearing is how a lot of these changes in policies, a lot of the uncertainty, um, has had a chilling effect on survivors. And again, I think that's why this webinar is so important, that how do we reach out to immigrant survivors uh, and let them know that your services are there for them. And what we were hearing from advocates, we did a survey along with the National Network to End Domestic Violence and a number of our other partners, CSTA, EPI, GBV, and others, the National DV Hotline in April, and about 715 advocates and attorneys completed the survey. And what we heard from them was that three out of four advocates, 75%, reported that immigrant survivors have concerns about going to court for a matter you know, related to the abuser or offender with fears of immigration issues, and that 78% expressed concerns about contacting the police. Um, and we also heard in this survey that 43% said they were working with survivors who had dropped criminal or civil uh, cases because of immigration issues. So again, we want to make sure that you know, these protections that are in place under VAWA, under TVPA, under rights of access to services for immigrants aren't undermined, and that we can enhance the advocacy and the safety planning so that people can you know, go forward and seek safety, um, but at the same time being aware and, and cautious of, of the concerns and, and trying to really figure out in your own local community how to connect with those who are doing advocacy. And it's opportunities to, to educate as well in our own communities of why it's so important for victims and witnesses to be able to go forward. Um, for example, there have been a number of reports from police chiefs and prosecutors of reductions in the reporting of DVNSA. Uh, some months back, the Los Angeles Police Department chief reported 25% reduction in reports of sexual assault and 10% reduction in DV reporting by Latinos compared to the same period last year. And Houston Police Department had reported that the number of Hispanics reporting rape was down 43% from last year, and reports of violent crime down from, were down 13%. Part of that, too, as we know, there's other state legislation in Texas, um, which has created a lot of uh, uncertainty as well for immigrants. So a lot depends on what's happening you know, in local communities, but it's important for us to reach out and make sure immigrants know that they have rights, that you are there to assist them and to see if they might be eligible for any forms of immigration relief. So again, not waiting for immigrants to come to you because we were hearing from a number of organizations that the number of immigrants calling had decreased. And in other places, it had increased. So a lot depends, I think, on if your organization is one where people know there's going to be language access, know that advocates are there to help them, and how to be proactive in doing outreach to immigrant communities. Uh, to counter the misinformation when they're told by abusers that no one is that no one's available to help them. Okay, this is an example. I included this here because uh, the Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women they have proactively developed these flyers that say "All are welcome, immigrants, refugees, undocumented," and have put out these flyers. And they have them in eight different languages and distribute them as well in different fairs. And it says domestic and sexual violence programs are non-governmental organizations that can provide shelter, advocacy, counseling, legal assistance to all people experiencing domestic and sexual violence, and that the services are free and confidential. And that confidentiality is so important. So this is just a really good example of, of proactively doing outreach and letting people know you're available. And um, MCBW generously has a link to those in eight different languages. So we can include that as well in case if you all want to model some of that you know, in your own outreach. But again, advocates can play a really important role in documenting what the history of the abuse is and having a trauma-informed approach to how you work with survivors. And we're going to talk about that in the webinar next week with some advocates on what does that mean to have a trauma-informed approach. Um, and in providing the enhanced safety planning, including know your rights information that we'll cover next week. And making sure that you don't send clients alone. Uh, when they do have appointments, but have accompaniment either to USCIS or to the courts uh, to really help them. One case, for example, we've heard a few cases where defense attorneys are now using the threat 
of changes in immigration law to try to dissuade victims come from, from coming forward. Uh, there was a case report in the Washington Post just a few months ago of a defense attorney in Baltimore that told a victim of rape that she shouldn't show up to court. She was undocumented. And he said to her, you know, ICE is in the courthouse. You shouldn't show up to court. You can get deported. And thankfully, this victim let others know, uh, you know, Baltimore has community trust policies. They've made it clear that they want all victims to, to come forward. She was willing to, to come forward and say to them that the defense attorney was threatening her. So they literally wired her. They put a wire on and had her go back and, and initiate uh, contact communication with the defense attorney, and he repeated that, and they were able to capture it, and uh, he was the one who was arrested and prosecuted uh, for threatening a victim. So these are the kinds of things we're hearing are going on, and it's important to create an environment uh, where any, any victim that experiences that can report that and seek safety. Um, so the next section that we're going to cover is access to services necessary for life or safety. Some of the questions we have gotten from people is, you know, can someone who is an undocumented status, you know, stay at shelters that receive federal funding? Sometimes people, or there have been some conversations about, you know, could that potentially be considered harboring or things to that effect? So we really want to put the message out there loud and clear and, 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 we'll, and provide you access to resources regarding this that in fact Congress, again Congress in a bipartisan manner, has recognized that services necessary to protect life or safety should be made available uh, regardless of immigration status. And this goes back Rose, to 90s. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Along those same yeah. lines, Rosie, I have a very interesting question here, and I, hopefully um, you're going to be able to answer this, but as mandated reporter, sometimes we need to report when a child witness, witnesses abuse to CPS. How can this affect immigration status? And then the second part of that question is, what do we need to be aware of when reporting to CPS? And I don't know if you're going to be covering that part here in this part of the training or the next and the second part of the webinar. Yeah, we'll be able to talk more about that in the second part of the webinar in terms of enhanced safety planning. But you know, generally speaking, in fact, you're going to see when I uh, proceed here with the list of services that are eligible or that, that need to be made available regardless of immigration status, Child Protective Services is listed as one of those. So it is important that a child who is experiencing, you know, abuse or neglect, Adult Protective Services is also included. Um, but at the same time, as you mentioned, um, you know, there, there may be concerns from a parent uh, who is undocumented. CPS, it's not, it's not a condition to take away anyone's child from them, that they're, un, you know, that they're undocumented. You know, their concerns may be that if, for example, charges ultimately were brought, let's say, against a father who was abusive uh, based on his, or, or even if charges are brought against a mother who's considered to be abusive. You know, if criminal charges are brought against someone, then yes, there, there could be repercussions with their immigration status. Not only if they're un undocumented, but it's an opportunity to point out that, for example, even someone with legal permanent residency status is convicted of certain crimes uh, they're eligible for deportation as well. The only immigrants who are not vulnerable to deportation are those who are natural, naturalized citizens. Um, so if there are you know, potentially criminal implications, uh, that could have an impact on someone's status or whether they're placed in removal. But generally speaking, if CPS um, you know, is investigating and connecting mom to services for issues of abuse or neglect, Again, this is where we need to be doing a lot of advocacy with CPS in terms of uh, if, if mom is someone who is a victim of domestic violence, you know, how to make sure that she is connected to the services and the support and the resources that she needs and that the children need, you know, regardless of immigration status uh, and, and make a plan for, you know, for her. So it is complex, but again, it does require relationship building and advocacy and accompaniment. Uh, to, to support a parent who might be, um, you know, interacting with Child Protective Services. So with regard to maintaining access to services for life or safety, as I said, when Congress back in 96, they did put in some new requirements when they did the, the quote-unquote welfare reform law, also known as PERORA, they put in some new requirements and limitations regarding access to federal public benefits for immigrants, but Congress specifically did allow eligibility for 
you know, quote, qualified aliens, and like I mentioned, those who are victims of domestic violence can, for example, in, in filing for the VAWA self-petition, be recognized as qualified aliens. Uh, but then it also created other exceptions that maintain access to certain services necessary to protect life or safety regardless of immigration status, even for those who are undocumented. And the Attorney General back in 2001 issued guidance on that, and recently the Department of Justice, Housing and Urban Development, and Health and Human Services in 2016 issued renewed guidance, a letter that sort of reaffirmed the, that and, and in one place consolidated all the different um, guidance around access to services. So that's one of the documents that we will be sending to you so that you have this letter. Um, but essentially, it just lifts up because we had been hearing, people have been saying, oh, well, that was something passed in 96 and, and the Attorney General's original guidance of 2001, people weren't sure if it was still in effect. So the 2016 letters to, to let people know that it still is in effect and that as a matter of law, immigrant survivors have full access to domestic violence shelters, support services, regardless of immigration status. And in fact, covered programs that turn away undocumented battered immigrants um, could be at risk of you know, being found to discriminate in violation of federal laws. So sometimes we even have gotten questions from like a shelter who said their board of directors wanted to know if it might be better policy so that they don't get in trouble just to, you know, to not serve undocumented immigrants. And we said, no, the opposite. Tell your board <laughs> of directors that, in fact, it's important that they not turn anyone away regardless of immigration status. Um, so the, the, the test that Congress set forth was um, those services that meet a three-pronged test qualify then for this life or safety exemption, which is services that are delivered in kind at the community level and that you don't condition assistance based on the recipient's income and that are necessary for life or safety. So as you can see, a shelter would qualify because a shelter is not giving out, for example, TANF benefits. It's not cash that's being given out. Rather, it's an in-kind service that's provided there. And it's not conditioned on someone's income uh, when they seek uh, DV services. Um, and, it's, and it is necessary for life or safety. So that's an example of how it fits that test. And these were a number of other services that are specifically enumerated in that guidance from the Attorney General. It includes crisis counseling and intervention, child and adult protection services, uh, uh, violence and abuse prevention programs, victims assistance, um, treatment of mental illness or substance abuse, it's, it's important to clarify, too, that short-term shelter also includes transitional housing up to two years. And this last bullet here, programs or assistance to help individuals during adverse weather conditions like hurricanes. So this was super important. Uh, for example, during Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma, there was great fear in Texas and Florida. We heard that there were a lot of immigrants who were very fearful of going to access uh, you know, help at shelters or where there was food distribution a water distribution and things to that effect. And it's important to recognize that those are the kinds of services necessary for life or safety that specifically are exempted and anyone should be eligible regardless of immigration status. And, and the Red Cross and others did a good job of putting out notices and bulletins, you know, trying to reach immigrant uh, communities with this information, but there were still many that, that were fearful of leaving harm's way and going to shelters because of their status. So this is something, again, that that's important for you all to know and to be able to share that information with immigrant communities. Um, and here's a list of you know, some additional programs as well uh, with regard to soup kitchens, senior nutrition programs, um, medical and public health services necessary to protect life or safety, so access to the emergency room. Um, there's also special protection for uh, pregnant women to be able to access medical care regardless of immigration status. Um, so that is, is important information to get out there and make sure that people can access those services. And also, as I said here, HUD had deemed, had made it clear that even uh, transitional housing programs for up to two years are the kinds of programs that are also deemed necessary for the protection of life or safety and considered short-term shelter. And there's additional guidance that has come out on that. And additionally, in Perora, it did include a nonprofit exemption that said nonprofit charitable organizations are exempted from the welfare laws requirement to verify immigration status. So while, you know, while the welfare, while, you know, the TANF officers, temporary assistance for needy families, do need to verify someone's immigration status if they're seeking TANF benefits, nonprofits who are providing services don't need to, um, 
to verify status. And again, I did earlier mention, for example, when you have a mixed status family, let's say the children are U.S. citizens, and if mom does go to apply for public housing benefits, she can say, I am not applying for myself, I'm just applying for my children who are U.S. citizens. And those uh, workers, you know, the, 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 the social service workers there from um, public housing cannot press her on her own immigration status or ask for a social security number uh, if she makes it clear that, you know, she's just there applying for her children. And then finally, so our last, yes. Oh, so we're at, we're at five minutes. Yeah, we're down to the end. I think we only have two slides left. Okay. Awesome. So um, a lot of this, as I've mentioned, I think really it's important for us to keep in mind the importance of enhanced collaboration. How do we make this part of the coordinated community response? As you know, VAWA really lifts up and encourages a coordinated community response. And so it's an opportunity for those of you all who are doing advocacy for immigrant survivors to be at those tables and talk about, you know, how are we making sure that there's access to the courts, to law enforcement, to services, you know, share information, uh, offer trainings on the VAWA provisions and confidentiality issues. Um, interestingly, ICE itself has a number where people can, like law enforcement jurisdictions that want to know more about the U visa. They have, there's a number that they can contact at Department of Homeland Security to get more information about it so that they can, you know, learn about the important role they play, law enforcement and others, um, for victims to access, uh, victims of crime to access those visas. And, and really, you know, expand collaborations to include some of the immigrant advocacy organizations so that you can be aware of what's happening in the community so you can offer information uh, for policymakers and others. Um, and to expand the community resource network available to immigrant survivors. Um, and then the other piece is in improving the protocols for U visa certification is a really good way to do systems advocacy. And I want to give you an example. In Minnesota, um, it became evident that in Minneapolis, victims of crime were able to get the U visa certification much more readily when they were willing to assist in the investigation or prosecution of a crime, whereas in St. Paul, the numbers were starkly different, where it was much harder to get certification. So you can have it really sort of right near each other, these two cities, it made a big difference whether a victim was on one side of the river or the other. So the you know, advocacy community through FOIA requests sort of got those numbers and then went and met with the new police chief in St. Paul and did some conversations, community conversations and dialogue and helped them understand, you know, why this remedy was so important and helped. And then the new police chief was very committed then to, you know, putting in place better protocols, better training to help with certification. So there are some DHS itself, Department of Homeland Security has some guidance on certification and knew what the National Working Women's Advocacy Project developed a toolkit also to help uh, law enforcement and others understand the U visa and help develop better protocols around certification. So those are resources that we will share with you as well and, and encourage you all to, you know, to be a part of that system's advocacy so that victims can have a pathway forward. And finally, here are some resources. Our website, but also ASISTA, Immigration Assistance. They are a national TA provider under OVW around the intersection of immigration and domestic and sexual violence and have a lot of resources. API GBV um, also has resources around language access and, and advocacy for immigrant survivors. As I mentioned before, the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project, they also are an OVWTA provider and have a whole library of resources, and there's their website, uh, and Tahiri Justice Center as well does advocacy on these issues. Um, and over here on this other slide are some additional resources. Uh, a resource library we have around immigration advocacy, but also National Network to End Domestic Violence. They have womenslaw.org, and there's a whole section there about immigration laws around the VAWA, the U, the T visa that are really written with towards advocates more than attorneys, so it makes, and even for survivors to be able to, to read. Um, so those are a good resource to look at there as well as Vonnet and another website called Informed Immigrant that has a lot of collections of resources. So we are at the end, but um, I do want to let you know that next week 
October 24, we're going to do part two. We are going to have some advocates join us and talk about trauma-informed approach to advocacy with immigrant survivors, how to do enhanced safety planning under these circumstances, what are some additional tools and resources for family safety planning, for agencies to know, um, and, and uh, resources around language access. So if you have additional questions that you were not able to get answered during this webinar, please send those to us as well so that we can cover them next week. And we will be sending you additional resources. And again, really want to thank you. Um, for your participation, for your interest, and most of all, just for the amazing advocacy that you all are doing on the ground uh, for, you know, with, with immigrant communities and with all survivors. Um, so, JJ, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rosie. And as always, you're an amazing presenter. The way you break down the information is so easy to understand. And thank you for the work that you do. Um, and trying to advocate for survivors as well. Um, again, as Rosie mentioned, the second part to this training will be happening October 24th, so stay tuned. And again, if folks want to receive more information on these type of webinars or more information on public policy issues, please join us. Please join the network by visiting our website at www.nationallatinonetwork.org. Thank you, everyone. And again, thank you, Rosie, so very much. Okay, thank you. Take good care, everyone. Bye-bye.